So you've come here for the truth. Well, we've got the truth and nothing but the truth. Here are your hosts, Robert A. Bianchi and David J. Bruno. Welcome to WMTR's Nothing But The Truth with your host, Bob Bianchi and Dave Bruno. So we're doing a recap of some of the great guests that we've had on the show. And we got such a great lineup, Dave, of people that are going to be coming on. Um, so I'm really excited about it. But one of those guys was Jesse Cole. Give us a little background about Jesse. Sure. Jesse Cole, another entrepreneur. He's the GM of the Savannah Bananas, the minor league baseball team down in Georgia. And uh, he is selling out. There's a, a wait list to get into his games. And it's not because of the Savannah Banana baseball team, let me tell you. It is because it's basically entertainment at its best. Going down to those games, I'm hearing so much about it. He invented a new game of baseball, which is incredible. And honestly, the video, is a you cannot miss it. Go to the landing page, nothingbutthetruthpodcast.com, to watch Jesse Cole in that interview. And Bob, what were some of your takeaways of Jesse? You know, we, we met Jesse at the Mega Success event um, with JT Fox, and he got on stage, <clears throat> stage we shared. Yeah. And uh, he, he was in that yellow tuxedo <laughs> yeah. with the yellow hat, and, and he had such a positive vibe and energy about him. And so, you know, kind of like, to be honest with you, looking at it from appearance purposes, you know, like, well, what's up with this guy? And then you realize that this is who this guy is, yeah. okay? And he's got such an infectious personality i'd call it that he actually reinvented the game of baseball and i'd say it's really more of an entertainment event with some baseball kind of thrown in there but it is really the stuff and ideas he has are really cool what impressed me about him was not to worry about what people think of you dave this conversation keeps coming back up over and over again and he's not to worry about standing out and the critique let's take a listen to one of those clips uh it's it's always interesting, you know, I've been fortunate to speak in front of manufacturing groups and banks and, you know, 2,000 people in an audience and 20 people in an audience. And I, I get two questions a lot. It's, it's energy, which you asked, and then ideas. And how do you come up with ideas and how do you get your culture to come up with ideas? And so it's the innovation and energy. That's what I get asked a lot. I, I think a lot of people, um, you know, look at me as a crazy guy in a yellow tuxedo and say, I can't be like that. And I'm not advising anybody to be like that. But what I'm advising is to find out who you are and find the best version of yourself and amplify it times 10. So if you are the best at X, you know, a lot of times we're too afraid to stand out because we're afraid of what other people would think. So I, I, I advise just amplify it. And I think a lot of people are afraid to ask me the questions about, you know, why I do the things that I do. And um, for me, this just is, is who I am and this is what I stand for. Okay, Dave, so uh, to me, for, for, to quote, for me, it's who I am, and this is what I stand for. Uh, obviously, he's killing it. So what, do you, what did you think? No, he is. And what he's saying is don't be afraid to stand out. And I think he is the example. Um, basically, everything that he believes in is fans first. And it's not about worrying about what other people think. Um, his motivation and purpose out there is to make his fans happy. Um, to bring a dynamic and a place to go to have fun. And uh, he's doing uh, the best at it, really, too. And, and I think the other thing that um, jumped out at me from, from what he talked about is that other quote about his uh, thank you letters. Let's play that as well. Since 2015, I started, and that's also when I started the thank you letter experiment, the thank you experiment, which really changed my life. I, I said, I'm gonna write one thank you letter a day. I was gonna do it for one year. I bought you know 400 thank you letters. And I started writing to people, coaches, teachers, authors, anybody that made an impact on my life. And I've stayed to it now over 2000 thank you letters. And it's brought closer connection, uh, closer relationships than I've ever imagined. And it's something I'll never give up. So that's part of my uh, morning, morning uh, ritual as well. And, and right there, we hear Jesse talking about this morning routine. Another frequent theme that we hear from the most successful is having a morning routine, getting things done. And part of his morning routine is writing a thank you letter uh, to people that he's thankful for every single morning. And he said he did this years ago, and it was at first just an experiment. And he says that he's continued to do it. He sent out over 2,000 thank you letters to people that have made an impact in his life. And uh, when we talk about relationships and, and making relationships, keeping relationships, I think that is an exceptional example of a routine that he does, sending thank you letters to people that meant something in his life. Yeah, it, it's uh, a guy who's got, is doing very, very well. Uh, he is an entrepreneur. He does not have to do this. 
it gets back to the theme that we've talked to in our last couple of guests have talked about this giving back to people just for the sake of giving back to them or being thankful for what it is they did for you and that every single person has said it has come back and so it's the mindset dave it, it's also how he views his his business with regard to the baseball team is he's more concerned about an experience for his fans as opposed to whether or not it makes sense from a quote unquote traditional baseball, you know, milieu, if you will. So he's willing to take that risk and that risk really paid off. I mean, he can't, he, he could build another stadium and literally have two games going on at one time filled. Oh yeah. I mean, there is a waiting list to get into a minor league baseball uh, game team, which is unheard of. I mean, so exceptional things. You know what, uh, what else jumped out at me is, too? Um, he's got all these quotes that he continues to, to deliver from, from what motivates him, what means things for him. But it's sourced. You know, Walt Disney said this and, and um, Jeff Bezos with the experiments and, and, and having an experiment every single day. And it's just one, an exceptional interview. Um, that that just really motivated me, and I know it motivated a lot of people. I've gotten a lot of feedback of it. And just final point, his energy. And he talked about this, how he maintains that energy. Um, we saw the energy at Mega Success. We saw his energy during our interview. And he talked about energy, how it keeps it up, how it's very important to keep up his energy. Um, just exceptional real-life hacks that we got from Jesse Cole. Yeah, he's like, you know, it may not be for everybody to be as rigid in the routine that he has, but we do hear from all these successful people that they do have a routine. It may look different, uh, but yeah, he is, he's really disciplined. That's the word mm. that I would use for him. He's extremely disciplined, and yet he also understands the value of getting joy out of what it is he's doing. And that's another thing that we hear. We just heard it from a guest that we interviewed that's going to be coming up uh, on one of our shows. It's Stephanie Hamill. It's about yeah. the importance of being joy, loving what it is that you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. Let's, let's talk about Stephanie Hamill. Uh, we look. She did an after show clip with us, Dave, um, yeah. on on her purpose in life that I think is really seriously quote unquote the mic dropper. Let's take a listen to that. You know, a lot of things motivate me. I, I am so thankful to live in this amazing country that we live in, and I want to preserve that. And you guys know where I stand politically, and that's why I'm so vocal about some of the things I don't like going on in our country. And there's some things that I want to reserve uh, to, to reverse and and preserve. Uh, that being said, what excites me about my career and what I do for a living is that when I wake up in the morning, I don't feel like I'm, you know, oh, I have to go to work today. I'm excited to get to work, to have conversations, to interview people, to inform my audience and to be part of this really important dialogue and conversation that's going on politically in our country. And oftentimes I'll have younger people ask me, like, how did you know what you wanted to do for a living? or I need help figuring out what I want to do for a living or what I want to be when I grow up. And my thing is always in inspiring people to start thinking about their interests. Like we're all different. So just because I went down the journalism political route, that doesn't mean that another person has to do the same thing that I did to live a fulfilling life or, or to have the things that I have or to live the life that I live. And so it's so important that people find their passion and that can be really hard for people to figure out what it is they're excited about. Well, it could be something like, for example, a chef, somebody who's so excited about cooking. And that is what gets them out of bed is because they want to give people the best meal they've ever had in their life. And, and if you think about those amazing moments when we go out to dinner and have had like such a great meal and how we feel after that, think of the person who is behind that, making those meals, um, giving somebody a very special moment in their life. and so. We're all participants in society and there's a place for everyone. And so I think that if people figure out their passion, then they'll wake up in the morning loving what they do, knowing that they're contributing to society. The, the most unhappy people that I see are people who are living life without a purpose. And that's how you end up falling into drugs, addiction, uh, into depression and a really sad place when you don't have a purpose. So I think everyone has to figure out what their purpose is in life and how they're going to contribute because we're on this earth together 
and we're not alone in this. And so we all need to work together to, to, to build a great community and make the most of the special unique lives that we've been given. Like think of what a miracle it is that we're on earth. Like we're here for a reason. So somebody has got to, you got to figure that out. Dave, like I, like I said uh, during that clip, uh, this is something that I'm going to make sure that we have out on our social media and our websites and our clients to see, because I really think that that was amazing. What do you think? You know, one thing that came out of that interview for me is get it done. Um, that phrase was used multiple times throughout the interview. Get it done. Have, have discipline. Hard work. You know, Stephanie talked about how nothing came easy for her. I mean, she came, uh, it was a blue collar family that she grew up in. Nothing was handed to her. She had to work hard for where she is and, and she's living her best life. I mean, there's no doubt about that. Anybody that watches her on her show in focus or watches her on Instagram and all the great things she's flying planes with her fiance, she's snowmobiling. Um, she's enjoying life and every moment of it. And try to get into a place and a profession and, and a situation that you enjoy. I, I think that's important. Love what you do, right? And for those that are fortunate to be in that position, um, reflect upon it and understand where you are and that you're doing the thing that you love. And maybe those that aren't, you know, maybe somebody's in a bad spot or they're not really enjoying where they are. There, it's never too late to pivot. It's never too late to sort of refocus and, and maybe change the trajectory of where you are. And certainly, Stephanie um, really hammered home that point about having a purpose, enjoying what you're doing. And she certainly is in a place that she's enjoying. You know, so what did you think about some of the things we learned from Stephanie? I think that, you know, we've, we appear on Stephanie's show. Um, and so I know Stephanie from one perspective, and that's the perspective of being a guest on her show. What I heard during that interview blew my mind away, but in a certain sense, but not in another. It's not surprising to me she became the success that she is based upon her mindset, yeah. talking about how defeats were not going to be blamed on anybody else and traumas that she dealt with. She was going to be able to get through it and continue to move forward, how her parents influenced her in the work ethic and the manner in which they went about things and about how she was focused on doing something she loved doing. Uh, all of these elements, like I think it's... I, I, look, the biggest takeaway for me, and, and I know this is a politically uh, charged statement, I guess, but I believe it to be true in my heart. And I mean, no disrespect to who those who feel differently. But when you are constantly living with a world of grievance and victimhood, then you've given yourself the excuse not to succeed, not to move forward. And I'm not saying unfair things don't happen. God knows unfair things have happened to me. Unfair things happen to you. Unfairness is part of life. Sure. And if you keep pushing against it and blaming it or someone else, then you always have an excuse not to either take another course and do another thing or to succeed. I, I believe deeply in the idea that we're becoming all of us like victimhood as opposed to victorhood, like being victors and things. Yeah, sure. And I think just wrapping up this, re this recap episode, let's talk about Connor Green. Connor Green is a major league baseball player. He's a pitcher, someone that went to the highest level of sports. And, and I went to see him at the Yankee Stadium. I watched him come out in the middle of the inning and pitch to the heart of the Yankees lineup. And we talked to him about staying calm um, and staying positive. And I want to roll that quote right now. I'll sit there and watch every pitch I've ever thrown to Aaron Judge before I go and throw it to him. I'll watch every slider low and out he's ever swung at. I'll watch every fastball inside he's ever swung at. And uh, I can see it right here on a nice little platform. And uh, I formulate my plan. And that goes into my head. I think that's how you start building your confidence, you know, when, you, when you're when you a skydiver and you're building these base jumping resume of jumps, you know, each one adds to your confidence for the next one, I'd imagine, you know, or you do something and you, it makes you more comfortable for the next time. So after you see, you can, you can literally visualize yourself. And that's another thing I do. I'll be on the mountain. I will actually visualize a pitch low and out and boom, execute it right after. You know, that quote is exceptional to me. Because, you know, that's somebody speaking at the highest level, coming out to a mound, really with the world watching in some of the biggest games facing the biggest hitters. And for him, it's staying calm. I mean, he has a message there to, to breathe, stay calm in your own headspace, and really have the faith that you could complete the job and do it well. 
You know, so loved having Connor on, somebody that's succeeding and, and succeeding at the highest level of baseball. And that is really what goes through his mind, breathing and staying calm at the most uh, difficult situation. Bob? Well, you know, this resonated with me because I think it's anybody who's in the performance area, trial lawyers, no, no different. I tried to let people know that adrenaline is going to be pumping. It, it, it does with me. I've learned to lasso it in more and more as time goes on, but keeping calm in the face of that. And then when you look back, you're like, there was nothing to be worried about in the first place. It's usually that your fear of failure. Um, yeah, you know what? That's, that's also in something that we do all the time. And, and one of my favorite quotes is pressure is privilege. And I think that hits the same sort of theme right there is, look, I mean, we're in pressure situations regularly, right? It could be in a courtroom representing an individual. It could be on national television with millions of people watching you, right? Those are pressure situations. And some of the people will be scared of that situation. That heart will go. Someone, some people will lose the opportunity because of fear right. in those situations, right? Another theme that we've hit regularly. Mm -hmm. But if you could harness it, you could understand that that pressure is a privilege. Instead of sitting on a couch watching, you know, you could harness that in the positivity, stay in your own headspace, start breathing, and understand that you have the skills and confidence to complete whatever it is you're doing. Yeah, the only difference between the greats, in, in, in my opinion, in many regards, I'll, I'll say as trial lawyers, that, that I know, is fear. The fear of standing up in front of that court, the fear of having to be perfect. And yet, you know, they, they and look, I experienced it as a young trial lawyer. I, 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 first time I gave an opening statement, I tell the story all the time. My heart was pounding so hard. I couldn't even hear myself speaking. I wonder to this day how I didn't just pass out. But, right. but I was proud of myself that I confronted. I think this is an important message. Courage is not the absence of fear. My mother taught me this. Courage is action in the face of fear. So let's all be courageous. You're listening to WMTR's Nothing But The Truth uh, every Saturday at 10.30 with Bob Bianchi, David Bruno. Dave, how can they find us? Sure. I mean, we're on the radio on Saturday mornings, but it doesn't stop there. We also release a form of the podcast, which is available on uh, Spotify and iTunes. Um, we also release a video of the interviews, and you could find all of that on the website, nothingbutthetruthpodcast.com. At the Bianchi Law Group, our team of former prosecutors and certified criminal trial attorneys specialize in criminal defense and domestic violence cases. When you need a law firm with courage, compassion, and the commitment to fight for you, call the Bianchi Law Group today. Welcome to WMTR. It's nothing but the truth with your host, Bob Bianchi and Dave Bruno. Uh, so interspersing with our guests, Dave, uh, you know, we're here every Saturday at 1030 in the morning. We're doing the podcast that are coming out on Wednesday. But we've also wanted to be able to do the best of the best of some of the segments of these guests because it's really amazing. And it was a great success. The first one we did, we got a lot of compliments at having broken it down. I mean, this stuff people are just consuming. Lots of people are texting us. They're loving the show. They're loving the wisdom and seeing the common themes that these great guests have. We've already covered in a breakdown Ryan Darty, Bruce Buffer, Austin Holman, KDK, JT Fox. I mean, all uber successful people. So we figured we'd just continue with a couple of more um, for this breakdown. And uh, let's talk about Christine Nielsen. Give us a little background with her because she's kind of amazing. Yeah, sure. Another entrepreneur, uh, transformational coach. You know, we learned about uh, that role and, and really what a story. And she, she told us about um, the relationship that ha she had with her father, and she had to move away from her father as a child and really look back on that as, as a negative, but uh, later in life really understood that her father was out for her best interest. And it's something that drove her. It's something that motivated her. And she brought real life takeaways there. And uh, we're going to talk about, we're going to play a clip about uh, her quote of the, about the scariest person in the room. And it's very similar to what we heard uh, from JT Fox about fear about fear being the thing that stops dreams. Let's play that. The scariest person in the room is us. The fears that we create and the reasons we don't go into stepping into power greater than ourselves or being going after our dreams and really nailing those things is it comes down to the self-talk and the negative, I'm not good enough, I'm not up for it, what will they think of me? And it's the fear of being judged it's the fear of being assessed. Well, if we're afraid of judgment and assessment, who's really doing the judgment and assessment? Who's assessing you? You are. You're either on the court 
or you're in the stands. I'm in action. So on the court means you're in action and you're going for whatever it is and you don't care whether they're booing or clapping because it's really irrelevant. The only person that can cheer you on is you. Yeah, Dave, it's amazing you, you bring up JT Fox because exactly when she talks about the scariest person being in the room, I was thinking about JT Fox's analogy of the permafrost. Exactly. And, and she, while she was a professional success, um, this permafrost was there that she could not get through. And it wasn't until she had that moment with her father where there was reconciliation that she basically said, well, I wasn't the best person to be around during that period of time, but she had this epiphany. So she became wealthy, not just as a successful business coach, but as a human being now. Yeah, sure. Another theme that I think comes out again and again with the guests, and that is fear. You know, oftentimes our fear uh, to fail really stops us from doing certain things. It could be in a relationship where you're afraid to speak up and tell somebody how you really feel about them, holding it back where it doesn't uh, communicate what your true feelings, or it could be something that you want to do and the fear to, to fail or what other people will think about your mm -hmm. failure. You know, so this this concept of being you being the scariest person in the room because the creation of fear and not stepping into opportunity is something that I could relate to. And we're hearing over and over again from these guests. Dave, this reminded me when she said this so much of a situation that happened to me that by all estimations of anybody in my life were like that person wronged you and a number of people so badly, uh, was so disloyal and things of that nature. And, uh, you know, there's a period of time where you have to get through that. But I remember telling one of the people who was affected that, dude, every day you keep thinking about this guy, you're waking up in the morning with him, you're going to sleep with him, you're eating with him, and he could care less yeah. about what's going on in your life. So if you really want to get back, it goes back to that re revenge is best served uh, uh, by a life well lived, uh, the quote similar to that. Right. And uh, to this day, that's the topic of our conversation. So she's talking about that fear of being judged. That is both your creation most of the time, and the irony is the people that you're afraid are judging you don't even even care about you you know the other um let's take let's take a listen to something she talked about shifting and altering the way we look at a situation transformation is is really looking at and shifting and altering the way we perceive a situation so that new results and new ways of looking at the situation can arise so it's a shift change in who we're being and it's not it, it's a mind it's a this is where you can use that word mindset because you're literally reverse engineering how you think about yourself about the problem about a business about a challenge and you're altering the paradigm that was holding you back mm -hmm. so if you use the analogy of the caterpillar to the butterfly the caterpillar is a caterpillar and then it goes through the the transformational process and then it's a butterfly the butterfly isn't the caterpillar, it's a butterfly, and the caterpillar isn't a butterfly until it transforms. I have to be, Dave, honest with you. You know, this was a hard concept for me to get as I was growing up, because the facts are the facts, and, and they're objective, and they are what they are. But the older I get, I realize that a lot of people who are mega successful, I don't want to say create their own reality. It, it's They are creating something, but it's the way they're looking at the situation as opposed to the way I was looking at the situation. What are your thoughts about that? Sure. I think my takeaway from this quote is, look, I think this applies to someone that's successful and also struggling. I think oftentimes people will look at shifting or altering when something doesn't go right. But that's not the only time to really reflect and look. You could be successful and do something better. You know, so it's always important to always be reflecting, always be altering, always be shifting, and always be pivoting. Even the most successful people need to be of that mindset, not just the ones that are in a bad position or spot. Yeah, I, I noticed that when I was uh, a young lawyer, um, there, there was definitely the older generation of lawyers would be like, this is the way it's done. That's the way it's always been done, mm. and this is the way it will continue. And I had some different ideas, and, right. and they were 
you know, summarily knocked down. It was back in an age where everybody didn't get a trophy. <laughs> okay. So right. you followed along or you got nixed. Okay. It was simple as that. But I'm very conscious of that now as an older person with people like yourself and the, and, and the people in our office to listen to what it is they have to say, because I don't want to be the same. I want to change. I, I, and I think that that's a key thing for any leader. And, uh, okay, so uh, next is my, my friend, Chris Hansen. Um, Chris is an amazing, won eight Emmys. You people may know him from To Catch a Predator at a minimum. Uh, he's a great journalist. He's out there right now with his podcast and his website, still doing the work and trying to protect the community from those that would harm children, especially with regard to human trafficking and online predators. Um, Chris was an amazing interview in terms of his spirit, uh, Dave, in a passion for this work that he continues to do on all levels. Yeah, I mean, Chris Hansen was a trailblazer. I mean, back in the day, before we had Instagram, Facebook, all these social media platforms, it was instant messenger in AOL. And I could remember those days with that modem sound. You log in, it was like, ah, you know, I could remember those days with the modem logins and things like that. And that is when Chris Hansen started that, that project and that show. And that was way before what we have now. It's even worse now with all the social media platforms and all the access to young individuals. And uh, nowadays, you don't know who's on the other side of that profile in the DMs and the messages. And it is so important to teach our young individuals that you have to know what you're getting into and always be careful online. And I think those are some of the main takeaways in addition to being very, very entertaining about learning about how he developed that project, um, what, it, what it resulted in, and what he's doing now, because he's got some great projects he's working on now. Yeah, let's just take a little listen to uh, him talking about grooming children and human trafficking and online predators. Well, you know, having been a prosecutor, Bob, that you know, part of what we do in any crime is, is demand reduction. If it's drugs, you try to demand, you try to reduce the demand. We treat some addicts as, uh, as people who have an illness as opposed to people who have committed a crime. But in the world of predators, it's much more difficult. We don't have the treatment protocol. We don't uh, have a one size fits all solution to it. So you've got guys who are heavy hitters who you can never fix, who need to be locked up forever. We have guys in between and we have guys you can fix. And so it's a real problem. The best thing you can do is educate your children. And you have to start it at a very early age when they first go online. And it begins with a discussion about how there are adults online who like to trick children. Children don't like to be tricked. And so that resonates with them. And as the children get older and up until and throughout college, you need to occasionally have this conversation. I mean, we see cases where college women and, and, and even women in the professional world get duped by predators online. And then there's a period where you hope everybody's self-aware and then it becomes the elderly who become targets. So it, it's constant education. And, and I speak at conferences all the time about human trafficking and, and online predators. And, and you just got to keep on sending the message out that kids need to understand that unless they know somebody in real life, they don't know them. And when you and I were growing up, the rule was don't talk to strangers. It was good advice then, good advice now. The problem is the guy who's a stranger on a Tuesday is so adept at grooming your child that they're not a stranger by Friday or Saturday and they're knocking on your door. You know, uh, Dave, uh, this is true to my heart. This is something as prosecutor tried to get out uh, to all those people. So, you know, he's doing a great job at that. I, I, I'd be remiss. Uh, you know, that's a public service message. Everybody should know that. Yeah. Uh, he also talked about this is your child. OK, this isn't the Fourth Amendment and privacy and what have you. These predators are literally coming in on phones, devices, games. We know this for a fact. We prosecuted these cases that you need to be a parent. I think it was that he basically said not your, a friend of your child. Uh, Dave, one last thing with Chris, probably one of the greatest guys I've met in, in the media world. I mean, with all the celebrity and all the Emmy Awards, I've, I've gone out with Chris, gone to dinner with Chris, I've met his family. Uh, he is just a tremendous human being as a person. I yeah, no, he's given us both opportunities on his show. Um, I, I, I went into the city and 
and did his show in Times Square, answering his questions, and it's it's full circle. When we come back, and, and he's not the only one that we flipped the script and have interviewed that we've been interviewed by. But what a great interview. Um, uh, go to the website to look at it if you've missed it, podcast or video available. All right, this is WMTR's Nothing But The Truth with your host Bob Bianchi and Dave Bruner every Saturday at 10.30, and our podcast will be out on Wednesday, and you can see all of our episodes and the great guests that we're talking about on video as well. The Bianchi Law Group, a team of former prosecutors and certified criminal trial attorneys. But here's the thing. He put himself in a box when he said... Relied on by CNN, Fox News, MSNBC, Law and Crime, and news leaders across the country for our criminal defense expertise. In a search warrant, you have to have probable cause that a crime's been committed and there's evidence in a particular place. When you need a law firm with courage, compassion, and the commitment to fight for you, call the Bianchi Law Group today.